Hey, it's me, Say7. This is part 39 of my library we're gonna walk through. We've got two receptions left in Star of the City. Been debating on which one to go through first, and I think we'll go over here. See what's going on. L5, 123's fourth door. Do you remember Jan got a prescript to go to some location? 14 steps to the right. 23 steps to the left. It's like he's whispering right now. There's a staircase. How far down does this go? The sound is getting louder, and I see a dim light. Is it really okay to head inside? Guess I have no choice. What's this? What are these huge machinations supposed to be? Welcome, welcome. welcome. Must have been an exhausting journey here. Come on in and make yourself at home. <laughs> Who are you? I'm the weaver working here. It's so nice to see a guest after such a long time. Come on now, don't be shy and step right in. A weaver? Yep, that's what I am. You were invited by the prescript, right? How did you... The likes of you couldn't even dream of finding this place without the guidance of the prescript. It only invites people here on a very extraordinary occasion, so consider yourself honored. Does this place have something to do with the prescripts? Yes, oh yes, it has plenty to do with them. This is the birthplace of prescripts. Prescripts are born? Your face tells me that you must have a lot you'd like to hear. And that's good. I was really bored too, actually. You should take a seat first here. This will be a long story. Here's your chair. Sorry, I have no tea. It's hard to come by warm water down here. Oh, where are my manners? What's your name? Are you a proxy? Or a messenger? My name's... Moirai. Did I say that? Moirai? Uh, hold on. Could you please slow down? First off, I'm Jan. Jan Vismok. I'm a messenger. I only started working less than a month ago. Jan, so you were a messenger. Yes, I've been delivering prescripts full of absurd and brutal orders. Oh, I understand. Prescripts are cruel indeed, and naughty too, which gets some people killed. I had to hear many resentful remarks and screams from the people who received their prescripts. Are you... Are you the one who wrote those ridiculous prescripts? Yeesh, so scary. Don't scowl at me so dreadfully now. Answer your question first. No, I'm not responsible for the contents of the prescript. My occupation is to manage these spinning wheels and loom. Huh? How are the prescripts born? You listen closely you can hear like a uh, it's like machine sounds like a humming I guess uh, 
Can you hear the sound? Can you feel the tremor climbing up your feet and touching your bosom? I can feel a tiny quake, yes, but what about it? It's just a small vibration. Wrong. This isn't a simple tremor. We're feeling the heartbeat of the city. It vibrates at random frequencies. Those vibrations move this pendulum over here. And I spin the wheels to make threads. Oh, why hear me describe it when you can see it in action? Here, why don't you come closer and take a look? A new prescript is about to be born. Pendulum swings above the threads I spin, inscribing meaning on them. Meaning? I see our random patterns. It could seem hazy at first. This is the language of the city, after all. You obviously won't recognize it. No, oh no. Language of the city? Are there more languages left to be found? Mm, it's a different kind from the languages people use. Oh, it certainly is. The thing is, I have no idea what it means either. We will soon be able to find out. There are 57 spinning wheels here. The threads spun from those wheels are then put in this loom, and I modestly weave cloth from them. Wait just a moment now. That was a cool noise. And there it is. Look, a prescript has been created. No way. Che Hyun, when you see a person on a three-way intersection waving their hand seven times, all of them to their house. We saw this prescript, I think it was in one of the... Uh... One of the credenza readings, I think it was for the Index Proselyte. That someone else was given a prescript to go to a three-way intersection and wave their hand seven times. It really is a prescript. Alright, no time to be spacing out. We should send this prescript to a messenger for delivery, right? Start with the stamp and... Let's see, let's see. Who it is N. N. Next to L. N920. And 1. You can see it on here. It's just like metal pipe. There it is. Pipe number N9201 is right here. Now we roll up this prescript and put it in here. The prescript will travel along the pipe all the way to the surface. That's what prescripts were? This can't be. Who made the spinning wheels, the loom, and the pipes then? Something else to know is that the location is like a question up here too. I have no clue. I was led here by a prescript too. Oh, oh, my predecessor was waiting for me when I arrived. But they left after receiving a prescript one day. Have you never questioned the prescripts? Oh, he's mad as hell right now. Not really. I don't have much else to do anyway. Do you have any idea how many people died because of your stupid randomly generated commands? But this is where all prescripts are made. And you could have at least tweaked them a little so they're, so they're not as cruel. I'm doing this because a prescript ordered me to create and send prescripts down here though. If I broke this prescript, the prescripts will get me killed. 
What are you talking about? You're the one in charge of sending out prescripts. What if there's another weaver like me somewhere in another nest? You don't possibly think that I'm the only one mailing all the prescripts for the city, do you? Someone has to be making the contents of the prescripts. Who could it be? In my opinion, that'd be the city itself. The pendulum inscribing patterns on the threads swings according to the city's motions, like I said just before. But steps of pedestrians walking around on the surface, wakes coming from construction sites, impacts created from some clumsy person falling on the floor, echoes of people's screams. Every little event happening in the city becomes a vibration that moves the pendulum. Even the sound of us talking. At the end of the day, a city folk can never be free from the city. Every deed committed by denizens of the city is ultimately the city's deed. We're representing its will in a sense. All the cruel things we've been committing were out of the city's volition? Why did the city have to be that way? Because the people are. The city was built by people, and their cruel nature had to naturally reflect on their creation. We were born that way. This is a mess. People built the city. And now the city is controlling the people? Does the order really matter much? I think the point is this, that whatever we do, we're essentially part of the city. All you do is weave cloth in this peaceful bunker. You probably have no idea what kind of brutal outcomes that piece of cloth you make can bring. That's why you can talk about this with such a carefree attitude. You're right, that's beyond me. I only do what I was ordered to do. Do I really have to care about that though? According to the city's will, its volition, the city's will matches the will of the people living in it. Oh man. That hits hard though. That means she's kind of saying like on some level the prescripts people get they they kind of want. Or maybe the city wants it. Did you know? They're beings born out of the city folks wants. Humans want to walk the path that's given to them. They're afraid to face the consequences of their actions and take responsibility for them. They know that they will only end up going the wrong way if they try to make their own decisions. They'd rather rely on something and expect things from it rather than to live a life of struggle. People without purpose in their lives desiring and yearning for something to open up a way for them. It could be someone wishing for equality amidst the savagery and voyeurism. Or it could be the vain hopes of those who want the city to thrive forevermore, providing for all of its inhabitants. That's how gods were born. People needed them. They didn't pop into existence because someone told them to. They can't be made up by anyone, nor can they be oppressed. You can't blame anyone for this. So many people, so many residents of the city want them. Thus, they're the fear that will draw near them, the temptation of happiness, the promises and wishes of all people. Are you starting to get why the prescripts came into existence? Uh oh. 
He's losing it. He's face palming. Masa. Haha. <laughs> yeah. Right. It wasn't my fault. People weren't doing inhumane things because I delivered prescripts to them. Those horrible things were meant to happen anyway. You're right. I think I see it now. It's the city. Oops, I want him to finish. It's the city. It's because people have always been cruel. Humans are born that way, and they have desperate wishes. It doesn't matter if there were pure wishes welled up from innocent hearts or ambitions born from greed. This is the result of what everyone wished for. Killing people with my own hands or taking away invaluable things from others. Shuddering in guilt, listening to those horrid screams. Well, I tried my best to seem unfazed. They're all useless feelings, eating away at my heart. Exactly. I'm just a tiny part of the world. I can never change the wishes of all people. There's no way I can defy this flow. What I did was part of the city. The will of the city. Forging prescripts out of spite and delivering them could be traced to the city's volition, not my free will. But that equates to my volition in the end. The city and I, and every person in the city, were one and the same. Do you think so too? Oh my gosh, look at the screen. It's like dripping. I don't remember this effect. Look at Yon now. He's distorted. Alright. The city must know where I should go next. Huh? Me? Oh, don't you worry. Just a moment, please. All right, dear. It's an invitation to the library. Prepared just for you. He's become a typewriter. As the city wills it. What was he talking to? Or was he talking to me all along? Well, regardless. Back to my post. Gotta keep my position. Let me speechless. So that's what the prescripts really were? Beings akin to gods of the city. I don't think I've heard or read any mention of such things. It does seem like there are some beings out there that fit the description that Weaver person gave. I think I've seen something similar a few times, though I don't know if that actually was one. 
Sure, if being is the right word for them, to be honest. They're supposedly created because people wish for them to exist. I don't know a lot about them, to tell you the truth. According to your logic, three scripts would be one such being, created from the collective aspiration of those who want to be given a purpose in their aimless lives. Do you seen one yourself, Roland? I don't know. I might have, but I don't really know what I saw. Heck, I'm not even sure if I saw it at all. That doesn't count as seeing one, does it? It's just that my memory about the details of it is blurry, and I don't feel like remembering it for whatever reason. I don't think highly of them, huh? Seeing what one of those metaphorical gods made out of people's wishes is doing, I can't see them in a positive light. They seem to lead people to ruin, in one way or another. Is it truly for their sake? What do you think, Roland? Do you think those gods are leading the residents of the city to the correct paths, as some claim? I won't lie that at a glance, they do look like a weird cult giving their lives to an object that swings on a whim. And they're giving arbitrary meaning to it, like how it's the heartbeat of the city. It's a consequentialist point of view shared by many other religions. The methods they take may be a complete mess. That being said, I don't think that there's absolutely nothing good to say about them. They fulfilled the people's wishes anyhow. The results are another story. Even though the so-called gods bring fear and despair to people, they get to live a life that's richer and more human. The goal might have been forcibly handed to them, but it's still better than nothing. Well, you're free to think whatever you want in the end. You could feel the prescripts are horrible, or a justified necessity, or whatever. You're right. Anyway, we should put our personal impressions aside and prepare to receive our guest. I'm counting on you, as always. Receive a prescript. Carry it out. Receive a prescript and carry it out. Receive. Greetings to your guest. If I may, I am... Angela. Yes, it would seem that you know me well. The prescripts know everything. The prescripts represent the will of the city. They know everything that goes on in the city. They know what I'm going to do, what you are going to do, all of it. I see. Do you have any doubts about the prescripts? Of course not. The prescripts are the city's will, and the city's volition is my will. To deny the city's volition is to deny myself. By accepting that as truth, you're acknowledging that you have no free will of your own. Do you feel that it is unfair? You no longer have to be driven to despair by the repercussions of our choices. You don't have to be worn down from the pain standing in the field of thorns on our two feet. By filling up the part that can't be achieved alone, our lives as humans can become much more lavish. I have the talent to walk the path in front of me, if nothing else. Even if I don't have much happiness, I know where to go in the immediate future, and that's enough for me. It's fortunate to hear that you are satisfied with it. 
How do you find your book in this place? Oh man, what a... What a deep... story. Okay, so we've got Distorted Yawn. Uh, if you don't know, like, apparently on a Korean keyboard, all of these letters spell out Distorted Yawn. That's a cool little fact. So this is a fun boss fight. And we're mainly fighting the left and right hands that have some pretty brutal cards. Uh, Giant Fist, 917 on hit, deal 5 damage. Very painful. Compress, uh, inflicts paralysis and feeble. Flurry of Fist, deal 3 damage on hit for each of them. And Baleful Brand, inflict 2 erosion. And they're immune to stagger. Alright, I guess I'll go over, since this is boss fight, I'll go over my builds. Red Mist, obviously. Using Meow's prowess and the strongest. Fervor for plus one power to motion level three or higher. And keeping in stride for health. Talents page, just a whole bunch of pierce power and pierce stagger. And since I'm not running any really good evade dice or an evade setup, I have Mind Hauler for recovering stagger resist. Uh, Lawell. Basically just pre-script the builds. Uh, I think it's really fun. I added Duel because this is just a really good card. And it should come in handy for clashing with Giant Fist. And Esther. And just uh, another pre-script build. That I enjoy. And Nikolai for giving everyone strength and endurance. And then Disposal will come in handy here. Hopefully. Let's get into it. And we only get one floor for this, so... And it's got its own theme. I'll let it play through once. While I focus on clashes and whatnot.
Okay. That song's called Will of the City. Uh, really good. Probably my favorite song. Okay, so to describe what's going on in this fight a bit, uh, we have to knock these hands down to less than 30 HP, and then they'll become... Uh, what is it? They don't die, but they become like lock. And then what Distorted Yon here does is he will give these buffs to them. And you can redirect them, but obviously you're never going to land a hit on him because he rolls for 20 to 30 on evade dice. Uh, obviously we have Vigil here, and whoever this is targeting, if it's one of my characters, then they lose all flashing power. So things like strength or like the slash power up or... It says Grace of the Prescripts will no longer apply. Those go cancelled out. Same with like Mia's prowess and stuff. And then obviously protection just means that I won't be able to do as much damage. Um, we're also on a bit of a timer here. Because after so many scenes, Disordered Yawn will use Sorted Blade, which is a really mean mass attack. This fight's kind of tricky. Yeah, I'm just gonna get hit by these. Um, this has a possibility of winning, even though it's kind of low. fight is so brutal because you just towards the beginning you don't have enough dice to actually flash with all of these for all the redirecting and everything okay, that kind of works out Oh my gosh, that clash tied. I'll consider that a win. Yeah, a lot of this fight just feels like trying to mitigate damage. Because you're gonna get hit by some of this stuff, especially this 9 to 17. The background's nice, it has like a bunch of threads and stuff in it. I really want to get to blade unlocking here. 
think I have to do it like this. Okay, I'm gonna get my power taken away. I think playing stuff with like high roll values is important here. I also really need to get a draw on that guy. Okay, we got one hand down. Somehow the evade dice actually did work there. I can see it's a law. The lock is a pretty annoying card on Clash 1, destroy your opponent's next dice. Uh, sturdy defense, pretty good to deal with that. to get twenty twenty charge here. Now I also need the five light. We also got draw. I might want to save Okay, I actually don't want to get him down to 30 HP this scene, but next scene. Hopefully just so I can set everything up to do as much damage to Distorted Yon as I can. I might accidentally do it. Oh yeah, I think I did. No? The dice got destroyed? Oh, I did. Okay. Okay, so now Yon enters this stance where there's a whole bunch of block dice. Okay, so here's the strategy. We're gonna use disposal to get rid of all of them. We can also manifest ego. Actually, I want this to play last. Cause it'll just do more damage overall. Because it won't be clashing against the block dice. And as we know, block dice will uh, mitigate damage by the difference in the rolls. So this should be a big damage turn. He starts off with 500 HP. And Nikolai will come through. And he got rid of all those counter dice. We 
got decent damage there. Of course, mass attacks coming out, and Ego Page has ruined it. I love that. I knew that was going to happen, too. It's funny every time. Obviously, mass summation 18 to 33 inflict two erosion. Uh, hurts a lot. Don't. Is anyone gonna get staggered? I might get two people staggered here. Okay, we should stagger here. Okay, no one, none of our guys got staggered. That's good. Okay, yeah, yeah, we'll go down here. That's distorted yawn. Very much a really efficient way of doing it. Uh, that fight can be kind of difficult. Obviously, I know what I'm doing, so. Brought in the right cards and everything. Could that person's death be what the prescripts intended? It's me. The prescripts look like they see several steps ahead, so it might as well be. Though, boy, what did that young guy endure and struggle so much for? Through his death, forging prescripts trying to express his free will. That was ultimately part of the prescripts. The will of the city, as he put it. Yep, after all, this is the fate those prescripts led him to. I said earlier that there are good things to be said about them, Roland. That I did. Is there still part of the city? I am still not completely convinced. I can understand it somewhat. Life is a human, never wanting for anything. What is the reason gods of the city emerge? Why do people wish for them to exist, even as they suffer? I try to think from those people's perspectives, the perspective of someone without a purpose to live. How I would act in their shoes. What's your conclusion? It can't be more obvious. I won't sit and wait for someone else to determine the meaning of my life or me like the others. I'm different. I'll seek out a way on my own. It's much easier said than done. They won't really realize what they're talking about until they're put in such a situation themselves. They can't be viewed all that badly? Correct. I've decided against painting them in an ex excessively negative light. That still doesn't mean I fully understand them, however. Although, I am curious about what you just mentioned as well. I must wonder what Yan's actions and the consequences to them were trying to show. I haven't got a clue, ma'am. I haven't got a clue. Who's to say what purpose there was to it in the first place? Those prescripts sure are an enigma. In this whole distortion business, it's scary how the process can be so simple. That demonstration made it clear. It appears that the breakdown of a belief when firmly held can serve as a catalyst for the distortion. Exactly. That's the scary part. It's what happens all the time in the city. So someone did explain to me why people aren't distorting left and right pretty clearly. Either way, this left a bitter taste in my mouth. Just like that other time.
now burn all these. Hopefully, we get the key page. Hey, we did. This is what it looks like. This is pretty cool. Here's Distorted Yawn. Have you ever seen a glimmer of light when you close your eyes? It's blindingly bright at times, and it shakes in an irregular shape at times. The sensation is often called a phosphine. Whenever I close my eyes, the blurry image of a bloodstained carpet appears to me like that optical phenomenon. The beginning of an unpleasant nightmare. Four mannequins that lost a face and an arm each are lying on the carpet, spilling red beads. Another mannequin has its hand on my shoulder. I turn around and look at the loudspeaker in the mannequin's face. I can feel the vibration coming from it, even though I can't hear what it says. How do you know what sound this mannequin is making? The vibration precisely matches the words I remember. My heart starts beating accordingly. The stand power of recall lost. Hold on, <laughs> let me start that over. The stand power of recall lost all my good childhood memories to oblivion, yet it brings back such remembrances every time I close my eyes. My response to it is always the same. Take the flower that slipped into my hand and nail it into the mannequin's heart. A beautiful tree in bloom grows from the cracks the flower made. It's as soft as the hands that caressed me, and it's as pretty as the sound that consoled me, and it's as sharp as the noise of that last moment when I was scolded for the first time. Every branch that grows from the tree causes a piercing buzz in my ears, and the petals hurt as they brush past my cheeks as if to make me feel the pain they hold. I stand still, like my feet were tied, so my body is covered in scars. 1. 2. Black marbles fall from the wounds. How long have I been in this cycle of pain? The nightmares have been with me for a good majority of my life. If I close my eyes, the memory of that time haunts me. If I open my eyes, the reality I can hardly bear unfold. I chose to keep my eyes shut because I thought I'd rather deal with the ever-echoing past. At least I won't be visited by new kinds of pain. Prescripts keep coming without a break. City folk meet different ends depending on the prescripts they receive, though their fates all share a commonality of cruelty. The resentment screams, tears, rage, and death. It's too much for my eyes. I sometimes thought how my life would have been if I stayed as a commoner taking prescripts like them. Maybe I was better off back then. Maybe I should have just died early so I could breathe again as another being. Why did the prescripts give me that order that day? I trace back the nightmares to remember the past. Everything was over, and I planned to follow them to death. I didn't have the courage to end my own life, so I picked up the prescript that I thought would spell my doom at last and read it slowly. All the fresh looking prescript contained was a command to be a messenger. It was pointing toward a beginning, not an end. I didn't see a single word that said anything about salvation or death. After being numb for a while, I finally tumbled down to the floor and broke into laughter louder than any sound I'd made before. I didn't help but laugh at my state. I wanted to end my life because of the prescripts, and now the prescripts won't even let me do that. Where does my free will ran run off to? I was frustrated. Not even my own life was under my control, for everything relies on the prescripts. Then I'll gladly play along. Even if I can't shatter the prescripts, I'll at least make a tiny crack. If I can show the masses that it's possible to oppose the prescripts, something might change. Something has to. It will make a difference. Once I had hope, I could see the way. And once I could see where to go, I had the strength to get up. However, I realized it only just now, what I felt wasn't hope, and that ignoring that prescript and taking my own life as I had planned might have been a truer expression of my free will. What is the right way to live a life in this place, I must wonder. I'm not even dreaming of a life that I can be proud of. How does one achieve the feeling that their life is bearable to live? 
let alone be satisfied with it. I thought I had found an answer to that, but in the end, I couldn't escape the prescripts. The prescripts are the city's will, as it is my will. I've realized my limit. I feel as if I've hit some kind of wall I can't overcome. However, I don't feel all too forlorn and miserable. Maybe there will be someone who can ride along with the flow, rather than break it. It just won't be me. I'm not fit to accomplish such things. So I want someone to find an answer in my stead, and I hope they can tell me that. Tell me how I can enjoy this nightmare. And that was a super deep page. So his nightmare is of him, I guess, killing his friends and family? Because a prescript told him to. And then obviously it led him down an awful path. Could have just not done it and died. Like, <laughs> or, and got punished by the proxies. I think that would have been a choice. I think, you know, back in the day, I don't think I read the Red Mist page. I really need to do that. So I'll go ahead and do that here as well. Okay, sorry, I had to get a drink. Red Mist. Ego. The weapon that corresponds to the mind of its wielder. The sword Carmen gave me was extracted from someone by chance. Giant eyeballs were attached to the sword adorned with crimson chunks of flesh. They watched my every move almost to the point of making me feel a bit uncomfortable. Wondering if this was a product of some new singularity, I asked Carmen what the thing was. She only said that I'll have to, that I'll have to get used to it, since there's little she can do about how it looks. Although it looked a bit creepy, it wasn't anything unbearable, and Carmen didn't seem to mind it as long as there were experiments to be performed with it. She added that I have to be careful with it, as it was thanks to sheer luck that the ego could be extracted at all in its unstable state. I had a plethora of experience handling various workshop products, so I decided to take the sword without much hesitation. When I first had the sword in my grip, I didn't feel anything in particular. All I could tell is that it's just a big, heavy, great sword. Nothing out of the ordinary other than its appearance. When I held the sword a few days later to protect a co-worker of mine, I heard a voice. It was the voice of someone desperately yearning for something. Unfortunately, the meaning of that voice was lost on me. Or rather, it wasn't even human speech. An awkward sound mimicking somebody. Noises of teeth grinding, bones crackling, mingling with flesh. Some things collide, fall apart, and mix in irregular patterns as if to mimic the way humans speak. However, that sound was too violent and sharp. A strong obsession of an empty one. Attachment. Void. I'm not sure what word I should use to define this. One thing I understood was that only I could hear that voice, and that it rang in my head rather than my ears. The stronger and clearer my aim to protect someone became, the louder the noise in my head got. Anxious that my mind might be consumed by the voice if I let it weaken my will, I tried my best to pretend that I didn't hear it. The eyes on the blade carefully observed me as I fought the voice in my head. The piercing gaze persisted as if to replace me if I faltered even for a second. It made me feel hazy sometimes. The voice was only a bunch of grinding noises at the beginning, but it slowly learned to speak over time. Soon enough, it started speaking in a language that I could understand, though it stammered a bit. It takes a human hide to protect human flesh, a shell. I kept asking for a shell. It didn't stop the voice, so the most I could do was ignore it. Even though there was danger in using it, its power was formidable. With it, I protected many a person and cut down many a threat. The voice became stronger and deeper but the more blood the blade drank. One day, it asked a sharp question. Don't you desire a human shell as well? I think back on it, the question might not have been aimed at me specifically, but only say whatever it wanted to say. It wouldn't try to convince or allure me. All it uttered was monologue. 
Yet, I was frozen stiff when I heard that. I kept saying something. Are our lives really worth the blood I spilled for them? I wasn't actually capable of forming such detailed sentences, but my head took it that way for some reason. Maybe I was thinking to myself. I denied its claim at the start. I never provoked anyone first. I'd only acted to protect others from an approaching danger. But I felt a small part of myself waver from what the voice said. What will remain when I keep washing away blood with blood? The bloodstained shell would be all that is left. I collapsed for a moment, but I didn't stop thinking. If I broke down, I might be in danger as Carmen warns. Carmen. Right. Carmen would have been different. Nothing could possibly beat the glitter in her eyes that shines as she pioneers a new path. Those honest, virtuous eyes. Even when someone jeered at her speech, even when everyone despaired in the face of an obstacle that brought progress to a halt, Carmen never stopped looking after others. She would always take the initiative to lead all of them. If I can protect a person like that, maybe this place will change. Yes, as long as I can protect that one person. As my thoughts became clearer, I couldn't just sit down. My body acted before my head could decide what to do. I don't exactly remember what happened then. When I finally took a grip on my rationality in a vast mindscape and came back to my senses, my body was burning hot. Is this rage? Have I been taken over to the point where I can't even see ahead? But I felt so calm, refreshed even. My head was kept cool, while my heart leading the body was aflame. It wasn't long until I felt that something was different. On solid armor, there was a layer of something tough and dense, but it wasn't fabric. A veil of mist was covering me. Astonished, I moved around and shook my limbs several times, and the veil dissipated soon after. When Carmen learned of this, she didn't say much. She didn't make a big fuss about it or suggest trying something with it right away. She only said that wielding this power is more important than simply manifesting it, but I shouldn't be lazy. She went back to work after leaving that peculiar piece of advice. Maybe she didn't want me to feel too much pressure. As more time passed, I could use the armor for longer, and eventually got to draw out its full power. I had a weapon and armor that resonate with my emotions. Using them, I could protect more people, and I was able to draw forth more durability and strength. The researchers seemed to be struggling to make progress with their work, but it was alright. I believed in them to make it through, and I just had to be quicker to do my job in the meantime. However, not long after, the incident happened all too suddenly. No, maybe it wasn't so sudden. The sign was there. Just around this corner, I can hear a child crying. She's sitting in front of a door. One of the two children Carmen took in died in a failed experiment. Unlike Lisa, who was wary and reluctant to open up to us, Enoch showed interest in our research and volunteered to be a test subject the other day. Enoch's speech was so concise and on point, everyone was shocked. He wasn't afraid, and he wasn't shaking. His voice was unswerving and gentle. Enoch's eyes weren't those of a naive little kid. His words and thoughts were surprisingly deep and mature. Even I was astonished. I sometimes wondered what made this kid have such thoughts, as I seemed to have already seen so much of this world's despair and misfortune. However, there was still no reason to allow a kid to participate in the experiments. Carmen spent several nights agonizing over the matter. So all of this is about Tifereth. Uh, Lisa was Tifereth's first self. All of that's in the Bottom Corporation. The experiment was authorized at last, though I didn't want to know what they thought of it anymore. What were they going to do, holding the hand of that little kid? I had to wonder if we were that desperate, but I shrugged it off. I wasn't one to stop him from doing what he chose to do. You should have been the one to die. The other kid, who was now all alone, mumbled crying. Her words had no weight to it probably spouted what she didn't sincerely mean, because the situation was too much for her. Yeah, I... I should have died, Carmen's answer. 
on the other hand, was likely sincere. Everyone stood still. A crack appeared in our minds which we never thought would crumble. Maybe we all expected it to happen deep down. Carmen's state worsened with each passing day, like a rusting nail. The sunny eyes of the woman who had brought us together were now cloudy, and she spoke less and less. Her voice was lifeless, and she had gotten so cold. It wouldn't have come to anyone's surprise if she died at any moment. She didn't bother trying to look okay. I think it was better that way. Everyone in the laboratory felt constraint in her presence. They viewed Carmen in different ways. Reproachful looks of those resenting her for bringing them so far, only to let go of her responsibility. Concerned looks of those worried that something might happen to her. And I guess there were some who had no thoughts. Research went on quietly, but not for long. A few days later, Carmen spilled out all of the guilt within her and plunged into it, never to come back up. Yep, so that's a uh, pretty brutal. Do we have two really brutal Redensa readings? Oh my gosh. But in the next part, we get to see what was going on with Zhao. I'll see you then. Peace.